Can I just say from the outset, what I want to do today is uh, by and large lay out the economic case for independence, because that's at the heart of many of the questions which are asked. Normally on the doorstep it goes like this, uh, can we do it? And they mean, can we do it economically? <coughs> can we stand on our own two feet? Will we thrive and prosper? And I will argue and hopefully explain why that's the case. Uh, and I'll do so by dismantling all the myths that the No Campaign use and have been using my entire political life. Indeed, the same arguments from the same people today that we were hearing in the 1970s. Uh, that we're too poor, we're too small, we're too stupid, we're too subsidised, we're welfare dependent, we're public sector dependent, and of course that the oil is running out. Uh, so I will try and touch on all of those. But before I do, can I just say independence is normal, govern themselves, the nation states. We're not asking for anything which is unusual or exceptional. It's simply the normal powers that a Scottish government should have, that every other government on the face of the planet has. Control of all of the levers to make life better for all of the people who live in Scotland. And at its heart, it's fundamentally democratic. Why should it be the case that this ancient democratic nation gets the government its people elect one or two years out of every four or five? With independence being a normal country, our people, the 5.3 million people from all backgrounds who live in Scotland, will get the government they elect 100% of the time a profoundly democratic prospectus and also one which is based on civic nationalism. I don't care about your colour or your background or your religion or your ethnicity. You don't have to prove your family were on the losing side at the Battle of Flodden to be part of this community. We're all in it together in Scotland. 5.3 million of us and our task in the Yes campaign is to turn an ancient democratic nation into a modern democratic state. It's something I think few would disagree with. Before I start on the economics, though, can I just say I intend over the next year to be temperate in my language. Uh, I don't consider George Robertson to be an enemy, merely a political opponent. I don't consider his British nationalism to be a virus, as the Scottish Nationalist creed was described by someone who should have known better yesterday. And I do shudder to think what goes through the dark recesses of the minds of the No Campaign when they describe the legitimate and democratic aspirations of a nation as a virus. But not for nothing do the No Campaign call themselves Project Fear. They say we're too small, too poor, too stupid, we're subsidised, we're welfare dependent. Let me give you some numbers. There are two and a half million people employed in Scotland. Two and a half million. Seventy-eight percent of them work in the private sector. The figure in the third quarter of 1999 was 76.2 percent. I use that figure deliberately. It was after 18 years of Tory government and two years when the Labour Party were in power and stuck to the Tory spending plans. Even now, even now, we have a higher proportion of our workforce in the private sector than we did in the third quarter of 1999. We are not public sector dependent, dependent on the largesse of tax pounds flowing from London and the UK Treasury. It was never true, and it certainly is not true today. And in terms of our economy, remember between 2010 and 11, we saw a record, a record 4.8% rise in exports from Scotland, a further 1.7% rise the following year, another rise again in volume in the first quarter of this year. We export more than we import. The UK has a trade deficit 
and a deficit in the trading goods of £100 billion a year. This is not an economy which is on its knees. This is not a poor, backward little place, as some would have you believe. Of course, those exports come from many sectors. Uh, I will talk a little specifically about oil, because it touches on the debate, not least because we're told, indeed we've been told since the early 1970s, that it's running out. So let's go with the numbers I think we can all agree on. These are UK figures, they're not Scottish government figures. There are 24 billion barrels of oil and gas yet to come. There are higher estimates, up to 30, up to 33 billion barrels of extractable oil and gas. Well, let's stick to the 24. That's valued at around 1.5 trillion pounds. Trillion's got 12 zeros for the non-mathematicians in the audience. It's a big number. The revenues from that would allow us to build an oil fund. If we'd begun to put some of that cash away when oil began to land, we'd have an oil fund now in the UK, somewhere between 64 and 85% of Scottish GDP, around 100 billion pounds. Instead, we have nothing compared to Norway of an oil fund now, a national pension fund of 450 billion pounds. And that's with 325 billion of revenues having accrued to the UK exchequer so far. PwC tell us there's 450 billion of revenues yet to come with the correct investment and the correct tax certainty. We may have let Westminster waste the first 325 billion of revenue. Our job is not to let them waste the next 450 billion of revenue from that precious resource. Now, I said there's 24 billion barrels of oil and gas left to come. Alistair Darling suggested it was only two or three billion. He said we'd overstated it by 12 times, which was bizarre given he used to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer. I suspect the big figure is correct because we know the sector right now are planning to invest 100 billion pounds in the North Sea and they're planning to drill 133 oil and gas wells in the next two years. So the big picture, the big picture, is that we're not on our knees economically. Instead, over the last five years, we've had one current account surplus compared to five deficits for the UK. When we have had deficits, they have been smaller than the UK. But none of this should surprise us. Because last year, with 8.4% of the population, we generated 9.9% of the UK tax receipts. We took only 9.3% of the spending. So our deficit is lower. That meant last year we generated £1,700 more in tax for every man, woman and child in the country than the UK average. It's not just one year, though. It's not just five years. Over the last 30 years, we've generated £1,350 a year on average, man, woman and child more than the UK average. So when they say we're too poor and we're dependent on subsidy, when they argue we have to pool our resources, there's only one pool and it's from the surpluses and the relative surpluses Scotland makes being pulled into the black hole, which is the UK Treasury, year after year after decade after decade. Now, they will also argue, I've heard no campaigners do this, that we only want to compare ourselves against the rest of the UK. I want to say two things about that. Firstly, it's wrong, and I'll explain why in a moment. But if you think what that argument means, it means that those who are defending the Union, the British nationalists, say that we can be as poor as we like, so long as we're as poor as the people in the rest of the UK. What a lack of ambition, what a lack of aspiration, not just for Scotland, but for everybody who lives on these islands. But to put our numbers into an international context, two years ago our comparable deficit was 5.4% of GDP. And that was better than the 6.5% GDP average of the 36 advanced economies the IMF monitor. It was better than the 7.5% GDP 
of the G7 countries, we were in a better fiscal state, more able to survive than the seven biggest economies on the face of the planet in GDP terms. Of course, the final thing they tell us is that we're welfare dependent. A notion that there's uh, structural unemployment higher in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. Unemployment's lower. Youth unemployment is considerably lower. Employment is higher. And we spend 15% of GDP, 15% of our national wealth on social protection. That's benefits and pensions. The UK figure for comparison is higher. It's 16%. We're not welfare dependent. Indeed, we're in a better position to meet our obligation to future generations than the UK as a whole. So where are we? Well, as part of the UK, we are part of the 17th wealthiest country out of the OECD list. Not a bad place to be. With independence, we would be eighth. And that's our starting point. A country which pays its way now, which has the skills and talent to prosper as an independent country in the future. And we want to have no more, no more, than the responsibility for using all the tools every other government takes for granted. Because right now we lack the levers to turn potential into profit, profit into prosperity, and to turn a rich country into a rich society. And I think at its heart, that's what this civic movement is about, turning a rich country into a rich society. You know, the way it's normally put, I know George Robertson has used much more elegant language. He has said, the atomization of Britain will deliver no solutions whatsoever, none whatsoever, for the catalog of global threats and challenges that must be addressed. The way it's normally put, less elegantly, is that there's not a single problem unionists see that independence will not solve. Let me turn that argument about. It says that to defend the union, to defend the union, 18 years of Conservative government, 18 years of John Major and Margaret Thatcher, 18 years while we watched industries being dismantled before our eyes was a price worth paying for Tony Blair and an illegal war in Iraq. I suspect there are guy few people in Scotland would agree with that argument. But at its heart, that's what defending the union means. The right for governments we do not elect to do things that we do not want, including illegal wars which were not certainly in my name. So, we have a referendum in a year's time. I believe that the economic case is strong. I believe the old scare stories, and that's all they were, of too poor, too small, too stupid, subsidy junkie, welfare junkie, public sector dependent Scotland, have been busted, well and truly busted. And I hope today and next year you vote yes. But more than that, more than that, and I'm glad there's a big audience here today. Whatever conclusion you come to next year, don't listen to the scare stories from Project Fear. Find out for yourself how the numbers stack up, what social policy means, what the civic movement will do to empower entire generations into the future, and consider, above all else, the fundamental democratic principle that you, me, 5.3 million of us will not simply get the government we wish now and again, but we will get the government we vote for 100% of the time. Friends, thank you very much for listening. I believe passionately that this debate that is now going to take place over the next year and in which you will have a vote is really more than just about a vote on the 18th of September next year. It's about the future of this country, your future, and your children's future, and your children's children's future. You'll have a vote, and you're not just voting for yourself, you're voting for future generations. So it is an, Im an immense responsibility that is in your hands. There won't be any going back. We're doomed. <laughs>
to make Scotland an independent nation state, a separate state. Uh, there won't be any going back from it. 51 to 49 is, uh, can be a vote that will determine the rest of your life and of your future generations as well. So bear that in mind, that we're not simply talking about the economy of today or the government, Scottish or national government of today. Whatever their <coughs> benefits, whatever their attributes, however much you feel strongly about it, you're talking about the constitution of your country and whether we become a separate state <laughs> and we break up the United Kingdom as, as we actually know it. Now, I want to say it right at the very beginning because Stuart eloquently has given you the case for breaking up the United Kingdom, but he's done it on the basis of a number of assertions that I don't accept. <coughs> you know, I am a proud and patriotic Scot. For four years, I was the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party. And during my four years, we put together the component parts of what was to be the Scottish Parliament, the first Parliament in Scotland for 300 years. There's nobody who can accuse me of being anti-Scottish or not being patriotic enough. And Stuart Hosey, who I know is a decent man and represents constituents in this great city of Dundee says he's going to be temperate in his language and won't use some of the words that have been used. Well, I've had some rough times in my political life, which started at the age of 15, actually in the SNP, would you believe, for a year. And one of the current members of the Scottish Cabinet once called me a Quisling. The guy called Quisling was a Nazi traitor in Norway during the war, Lord Ho Ho, who uh, broadcast to the British people on behalf of the Nazis at that time. And that member, current member of the Scottish Cabinet, has not in any way apologised to me for what he said at the time, although I believe that he regrets it now. But I believe that we need to argue this case on the basis of, of facts, not on the basis of assertions. I don't believe that Scotland is too small. I don't believe that Scotland is too weak. I don't believe that Scotland is welfare dependent. I've seen countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovenia, Slovakia, Montenegro, Serbia, countries that have all become, in the last few years, independent nation states. If they can survive, of course my country can survive. Of course, we've got the economic vitality, and we've got the people, and we've got the resources. But why do we want to make a separate nation state at this point? The case that has been made, you will hear, is that actually our economy is stronger than most of the United Kingdom, and indeed it is. Recent surveys have shown that this Scotland of ours is actually the second richest part of the United Kingdom after the southeast of England. That's inside the United Kingdom, not as a separate state. We're doomed. <laughs> so I don't take any of these assertions at face value, but I believe that the argument can be made for a better Scotland once we've got rid of this preoccupation with the separatism that the present government is obsessed with. I want the Scottish Parliament to focus its mind on education. I want, I want them to to look at how our education is going to be fitted for the 21st century, how you and your children will get the skills that will, that will actually go on and take you through into, into the difficulties and challenges of the world that's ahead. I want a better health system. A couple of weeks ago, we found out that there were a record number of complaints against the NHS in Scotland. That's a devolved matter, and I want more attention to be paid to that. I want more attention paid to transport. At the weekend, I was in the Western Isles, one of the remotest parts of the United Kingdom. I want those areas, and like my native island of Isla, to be given a bit more attention than they get at the present moment. I want to see successful agriculture. That's what I studied when I was at university in Dundee. I want to see a fairer legal system, and I want to see a better and improved local government system that works and works for the people of Scotland. All of these areas are in the province of the Scottish Parliament, but yet we're obsessed 
and we seem consumed at the moment solely and simply with this constitutional issue. There are huge issues out there that you will have to face in this world. An ageing population with a <laughs> workforce. The mixture between the private and the public sector. Incentives uh, for people to grow companies and entrepreneurships. How are we going to give people the skills and the talent that will fit them to deal with emerging markets? These are all big issues that will affect you and the future generations on whose behalf you're going to make a decision, an irrevocable decision, on the 18th of September next year. So I resent those of us who say, don't break up Britain, being called anti-Scottish, as I have been. Every time we ask a question, we're told we're talking down Scotland. I think that's wrong, and it's unfair. It's not anti-Scottish to keep the country that we know together and working together and not fragmented. It's not anti-Scottish to see well, the don't. waste involved, <laughs> involved in creating new embassies and new ministries, the Ministry of Defence, new social security institutions, as well as the DVLA, the BBC, the CAA, a whole host of organisations that will have to be created. Well, it's not, it's not anti-Scottish to highlight the transition costs, the huge transition costs of going from being part of the United Kingdom to being a separate state with stamps and uniforms and anthems <laughs> and all of the rest of these things that would have to come with separation. It's not anti-Scottish to ask the basic question about what currency would we have in an independent Scotland. Ten years ago, the leader of the SNP said that sterling was a millstone round Scotland's neck. But now he wants a fiscal well, union <laughs> with the Bank of England taking the decisions on behalf of the independent Scottish state. But of course, in between, he was in favour of the euro. When I debated with him in 1996, he said the euro was the way through. That was the way in which a Scotland would go, but suddenly, after the Eurozone crisis, it's not there. So we don't know whether there would be a currency union that would depend on the rest of the UK agreeing, or whether, whether the, the pound would be used unilaterally, or whether it would be the euro that we would be obliged to sign up to. Some people say if we, to, if we were to be part of the European Union, or whether it would be a separate Scottish currency. A fundamental issue. And we don't know the answer well, to it. It's not anti-Scottish to ask about the thousands of Scottish jobs that are for the Scottish people employed in, for instance, the defence industry, when most of the market is going to be down well, south. Do. Hundreds of thousands of jobs involved in financial services, when we would have to have a separate financial well, services do. regime <laughs> applying in different parts of the United Kingdom. It's not anti-Scottish to ask whether we would automatically be in the well, European do. Union, as is sometimes asserted, because practically everybody in the European Union says no. A new separate state would have to apply for membership. And the SNP say we would have to negotiate anyway, because we want better terms. But a negotiation implies gains and losses. What would we lose? The British rebate? perhaps our fishing limits, well, what would we gain in the process of these negotiations? We don't know, and we won't know until after you've well, cast do. your vote in the <laughs> of September next year. It's not anti-Scottish. Indeed, it's quite patriotic to ask whether Scotland would be a member of NATO, well, the organisation <laughs> I, as a Scot, led for four years. The self-defence alliance, We're doomed. the pillar, the, the cornerstone of our security and that of 25 other nations in Europe. When it's been made clear by the SNP that Trident would go, the British Independent Nuclear Deterrent would go, which is part and parcel of NATO's policy, irrespective. So they make that a condition of membership, knowing that the condition would not be acceptable to the other members. And, of course, it's not anti-Scottish to ask about pensions. Well, That's in the distance from you, but not of your parents, and certainly not of your grandparents. And that's a big issue that's being talked about today because they've made a promise, it would appear, 
that the retirement age will not go up to 67 in 2026, remember, in an, in, in an independent Scotland. Another, another unrefreshed attempt <laughs> that's been made in the run-up to this referendum campaign. And frankly, you know, you're going to hear a lot more of these promises. There is no doubt at all about that. So why should we create an independent Scottish state? We're not a colony. Most of the countries that have become independent since the war were colonies. We're not oppressed. Nobody believes that we're oppressed. I'm sure there are, there are people here from other countries other than Scotland here. This, uh, Scot you know, Scotland's not oppressed inside the United Kingdom. We're not discriminated against. If you turn on your radio in the morning, you get the voice of Jim Naughty. We're doomed. If you're interested in current affairs, you go to bed listening to Kirsty Walk on Newsnight. <laughs> Every Sunday morning, the main starting point for the week, you've got Andrew Marr, who came from Invergowrie, just <laughs> outside of Dundee. There are Scots at every level of government and public and private sector in the United Kingdom, all of them. Few of them perhaps going to have a vote in this referendum, but all of them proud Scots who've never been held back by the fact that they were Scots inside the United Kingdom. We're not disadvantaged inside the United Kingdom. For whatever, for whatever statistics uh, we hear, and uh, we hear from, uh, fr from, from the nationalists, actually what Stuart said was Scotland's economy is actually doing quite well. Lowest level of youth unemployment, you said. Your highest level of employment. We're the richest part of the United Kingdom outside of the South East, and we're in the United Kingdom, so we're not being disadvantaged by being part of a single market, part of a single country. And that's really worth you know, bearing in mind when it comes to any decision that you take. There's no linguistic differentiation, there's no great cult cultural uh, discrimination that might argue for it, like it does in some other countries. You know? In Flanders and Belgium, they say, why can't we become an independent state? Or Catalonia and Spain, where a million and a quarter of people marched in the streets. They say they want to become an independent state, but they've got language and culture and all these sort of things. We don't have any of that. And we've got, in addition, in Scotland, a parliament of our own handling all those domestic arrangements that matter to us and to the people of Scotland. Education from nurseries to universities, health, housing, local government, transport, tourism, agriculture, fisheries, and more. And indeed, next year, under the calm and reform, more power <laughs> to the Scottish Parliament. And not only that, we'll have power over income tax, a, ch a big chunk of income tax and stamp duty, and extra powers to legislate in areas like the licensing of air guns. The Scottish Parliament, after the Cowman reforms come in, will raise 30% of its own revenue in Scotland. All of these things have happened as well. Now, Stuart and the Nationalists keep going on, and you'll hear it relentlessly repeated that we, don't, we wouldn't get the government we want, that we don't get the government that we voted for. And that's perfectly true, because the votes are spread throughout the United Kingdom. It's not always true. The English sometimes resent the fact that they get governments based on Scottish members of Parliament. But bear this in mind. At the last election, Stuart's party got 45% of the vote in the Scottish Parliament elections. Only 50.1%, a whisker more than half the Scottish electorate voted in these elections. So that means that 23% of the Scottish people voted for the SNP. Only 23% of those eligible to vote in Scotland voted for the SNP. And if you actually take the ones <laughs> the ones who voted, 55% of us who voted in the Scottish Parliament elections didn't get the government we wanted. We got an SNP government, but more than half the Scottish people didn't get We're doomed. the government <laughs> that they chose. Now, that's the way the electoral system worked. I helped to construct the electoral system for the Scottish Parliament, so I least of all can complain about it. That's the way it works. But let nobody tell you that we've got the government that the overwhelming majority of the Scottish people voted for. 
So when you come to cast your vote on the 18th of September next year, I hope you will spend your time interrogating those who say it's a simple, easy step for Scotland to go from part of the United Kingdom to being an independent nation state. It's not risk-free, it's not going to be easy, and it certainly isn't going to be cheap. We're doomed. The decision, at the end of the day, will be yours. Ask the questions, by all means. Take a sober decision. And remember all the time that you're not just deciding for yourself, you're deciding for the future as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to George Robertson. I'm going to ask uh, Stuart Hosey to come back. Uh, please, both of you, stick to time, five minutes each. Remember on this one. Thank you. There were a great many things I will not be able to rebut them all. Uh, George started by saying there's no going back. It's one of the things they do to frighten you. Can anyone tell me the single country in the last hundred years which has become independent, which has chosen to go back and give up its independence. That's correct. There isn't one, because it's normal. George used the language of breaking up. I'm not surprised that's part of the scare story, project fear narrative. This isn't about breaking a social union. This isn't about breaking trade links. This isn't about breaking or putting up barriers to friendship or family. It's about creating a new democratic state from an old and ancient democratic nation. It is profoundly democratic. George, just at a slight tangent, I laughed when you uh, described having helped build the electoral system for the Scottish Parliament, one which was specifically designed to stop a majority government, and particularly, specifically, doubly designed to stop a majority SNP government. Uh, I'm glad that plan went as well as devolution would end the SNP. Uh, I'm glad, George, you were wrong about that. You, um, you said I'd made a number of assertions. When they say we're too small, too poor, too stupid, subsidy junkies, welfare dependent, these are things which have been said by unionists, not by me. I then laid out numbers, lots of numbers, on purpose because I like evidence-based policy-making. George, as for my assertions, tell me which number was wrong. Just one. The assessment's mine. The political argument's mine. The numbers all stand up. There were no unfounded assertions. George also said, and he laboured the point, and I know why, he's a patriotic Scot. They all say that, normally followed by a but. George, I'm not questioning your patriotism. Never would, never will. This isn't about patriotism. It's not about donning a kilt on Burns Night. We all do that. That's a fine thing. This is about political decision making. It's so that we can change business tax rates to get growth. So that we can, George, look at the demography in Scotland and work out that we can allow our pensioners to retire earlier, which I think is a good thing, given that many people in Scotland die rather younger than the average across the UK. He said uh, we're wealthy inside the UK. Absolutely right. He was right. The second largest, second wealthiest part of the UK outside of London. Think what more we could do if we could control social policy so that this wealthy country could be a wealthy society. Think what more we could do if we had control of business taxation to grow the economy yet further, to provide more jobs. I heard a Labour politician recently criticise me for supporting a lower corporation tax rate. He said, we need this to be sustainable. A modest cut in the headline rate is forecast to deliver 1.9% extra GDP over the medium term and 27,000 extra jobs over and above the ones we would have created. I would love to see that particular politician, no names, no pack drill, run around the people of his Glasgow constituency, telling all the mothers and grandmothers, fathers and grandfathers, that because he doesn't agree with the SNP, he's going to take away 27,000 extra job opportunities 
for unemployed youngsters in his constituency because that's where that argument ends. George mentioned NATO. I'm not surprised. We don't have time to do the whole NATO debate. That would take the whole hour. But on the key point of nuclear weapons, George, you know this. You're General Secretary. There are only three countries in NATO with nuclear weapons. France, the UK, as for the independent uh, deterrent, well, that's a matter of debate, and the United States. The vast majority of the rest are like Scotland. They're not just non-nuclear, they're avowedly anti-nuclear. NATO, as you know, George, is a pragmatic organisation. Who would not want Scotland as a willing member, given our strategic position with the North Atlantic Gap and the natural interest we have in the high north, among other things? He asked about the currency. George, the answer is sterling. And I say that because you said we believed in the euro. Labour still believe in the euro, technically. But the answer is sterling. He's been told that. The No campaign have been told this a hundred times. The reason they keep asking the question is because they don't like the answer. They want to continue to give you the impression of uncertainty and that the key questions have not been addressed when they have. Uh, how long do I have, Wallace? 30 seconds. I've got 30 seconds, in which case... Um, I will, uh, I'm going to wind up there. There'll be plenty of time to do more rebuttals when the questions come in from the hall. Other than to say one thing, education is a devolved matter, which is why I'm delighted intermediate exam results are up, higher exam results are up, advanced higher results are up to 82%, that there are a record number of young Scots in full-time college places, there are 25,000 of you starting university this year, and our national apprenticeship scheme of 26,500 starts last year, is something we should all be proud of, Labour called for, and then sadly voted against when the time came. But we'll have plenty of time to talk about that in detail if those questions arise. Thank you. Thank you very much to Stuart Hosey. George Robertson, five minutes, please, in terms of rebuttal. I've just discovered that most of you will know that if you use the iPhone stopwatch, it doesn't work when the screen goes blank. Uh, so I was relying on modern technology, but I'm not a terribly modern person. So I'll now go back to having my watch here as well. Um, no going back. I think one of the things that comes out of these debates, and you'll need to watch during the coming year, is the fact that a lot of these questions will remain unanswered because they can't be answered before the 18th of September next year. It's a fundamental point that you've got to bear in mind. It's only after the 18th of September next year, and a yes vote, if that was the decision of the Scottish people, that the negotiations would actually start with Westminster, with Brussels, with NATO, with a whole series of international relationships that we have. The currency union is put forward by the SNP, but depends entirely on the rest of the United Kingdom agreeing that Scotland will be part of a currency union but be a completely separate state. And there are no indications at all that the Bank of England, the UK Treasury, the Welsh, the Northern Irish and the English are in favour of giving that, 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 that concession. But it, the negotiations can only start after the yes vote takes place. Because otherwise, who does the negotiation? You can't do it now. But Michael Moore is a Scottish MP and he's Secretary of State. <laughs> State. Which side is he supposed to be in the negotiation? Is Alex Salmond going to do the negotiations beforehand? Because he might not be Prime Minister of the Independent Scotland. We don't know what the government of the Independent Scotland would be. They say that the election would take place, the, 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 the election for the new Independent Scottish Parliament would take place a year after the yes vote in the referendum. 2016. But we don't know who's going to be doing the negotiations. Still less do we know what the outcome would be. And there's no second vote on the outcome of the negotiations. If they decide they're going to cut our We're fishing doomed. limits, if they decide they're going to get about a worse deal from Europe on agriculture, We're if doomed. the decision is that there's no currency union and that, the, and that Scotland would be using the pound like the Panamanians <laughs> use the American dollar, we won't then have a second decision. So you have to bear that very much in mind. Now, you know, Stuart says, well, some of the unionists have said that we're too poor, too, too stupid, and too welfare dependent. Well, I haven't heard many people doing it, but there are as many people 
on the on the, the no side of the argument as on the yes side of the argument, saying things that are not part of the mainstream. In a democracy, that's going to happen. <coughs> Dennis Canavan is the chairman of Yes Scotland, and I bet Stuart doesn't agree with everything that he says about the way Scotland should go before. What about the people in the Yes campaign executive who say we should have a Scottish currency? So the debate will rage, and you've got to listen, and you've got to try and get through you know, what that would be. We're going to change the taxation for business in order to produce growth, but there's only one thing that's <laughs> ever been mentioned by, uh, by Alex Salmon, and that's corporation tax, a race to the bottom, reducing it below whatever the United <laughs> Kingdom rate is, and the United Kingdom rate is actually going down at the present moment. A race to the bottom seems to be the only way in which people can say we'll actually be richer and better than we are just now. So the decision, as I say, is a decision you've got to take in principle. The rest of it is deeply, deeply uncertain. We're because we can't know the complexion of a future government and whether it's going to be led by Alex Salmon or by, or by Joanne Lamont or by the Greens or by the Liberal Democrats. That will be a separate decision taken. We don't know what the outcome of these serious, difficult and hugely important negotiations are going to be after the yes vote and what the outcome is going to mean for you and me and for our families. And in that degree of uncertainty, we're being asked to cast our vote on a blank cheque to buy a pig in a pool. And I don't think the sort of people are daft enough to go for that. Thank you. OK. In no particular order, but I think I've got them all answered. In terms of culture, with three indigenous languages, Scots, Gaelic and English, and we have many, many, many other more languages and cultures. And that melting pot is a huge strength for Scotland, where we have the indigenous cultures which are vibrant and which must not be ignored, and the new cultures, new Scots from around the world who add to this land of ours. Yes, Whoever said it, this is a step forward for democracy. It's not all about oil. I was very clear not I was very clear to say that. And let me give you another number on top of that. Without oil, productivity in Scotland is ninety nine percent that of the UK, almost exactly the same. With oil it's 118% of the UK's productivity. But what you do is you harvest the oil, you use it sensibly, you invest the surpluses in an oil fund, like Norway who now have a situation in some years where the value of dividends from their oil fund is bigger than the oil revenues themselves. Because they've invested only since 1996, when they started populating that fund, they are now in a position with a £450 billion ethical fund where they own nothing but they invest in many things, that their oil will last forever and help fund their economy as it transfers from energy to other things, and that's what we need to do. Uh, the question was about economic strength, which George, uh, George agreed with, and the question was what's holding us back. The answer is absolutely nothing except the yes vote next year, when we can have the powers to use the resources and the assets and the talents to benefit all of us. The first question was about the two-party political system. Uh, absolutely right. Not only did we not vote for the Tories under Thatcher and Major, there were no Tory MPs left in Scotland at all. Uh, the people who voted for uh, David Cameron and indeed for the Liberals before they did what the Liberals did and went into power with the Tories, it uh, was very small indeed. Uh, it's an old joke, we now have one Tory MP, there are more pandas, I say come on the pandas, but the bottom line there is correct. This is likely not guaranteed, but likely to be a progressive country, with parties on the centre-left. And I'm even including the Labour Party, if they can ever reform and restructure and throw off the chains of Ed Miliband's London control, could be in power again, although I'm not sure if that's a particularly good selling point at the moment. The, um, who was it said, we don't know, preying on uncertainty? Who was it said that? The German left. Ah, yes, that's <laughs> I should have written down German student, but I didn't, and I do apologise. That's absolutely right. 
When they say we don't know, when George repeats, as I'm sure he'll do about 15 times in the next few minutes, there's great uncertainty, there's great uncertainty, there's great uncertainty. It's merely preying on the fears. I think the one thing we can say with pretty decent certainty is there wouldn't have been an illegal war in Iraq that an independent Scotland would have taken part in. There wouldn't be the introduction of a bedroom tax which penalises 105,000 people in Scotland which penalises 80% of those, or sorry, 80% of those penalised are households with an adult with a recognised disability. We wouldn't have been doing that. Now, on the question of defence and invasion, if we were properly defended now, then that argument might hold water. But when the Russian aircraft carrier had to shelter in the storm last year, the Royal Navy Fleet Reserve had to sail from the south of England with one engine. It took 35 hours to get there. Had they wished, the Russians could have unloaded three battle groups, an entire brigade. There are no surface vessels in Scotland. The British state have chopped up long-range reconnaissance. The Nimrods have been chopped up. We're building aircraft carriers with no planes to go on them. They've sold the vertical lift harriers to the United States Marines. They're absolutely delighted with their purchase. Here's the real argument. In the period of the last SDSR, Security and Defence Review, there was an underspend in Scotland, an underspend of £5.6 billion on recruitment and procurement, people and equipment, not operations, people and equipment. With independence, we can spend more money to have a properly equipped and professional defence force that we do not have and still make a saving. And just for the avoidance of any doubt, over that period of the last SDSR, consecutive UK governments managed to lose 11,000 defence jobs in Scotland. So whatever else you do, don't listen to the scare stories about defence. Now, on the question of Devo Max, I think the Scottish Government were incredible. They left the door open for the Devo Max question to be on the ballot paper for a year so we could test independence against the status quo, against Devo Max. For a year, the door was held open. But those who purport to believe in it could not coalesce or chose not to coalesce around any plan. And I think if anyone believes we're going to get more if we vote no, you're kidding yourselves on. Ian Davidson, a Labour MP, has said they want to rip powers from the Scottish Parliament. Others, Michael Kelly, a Labour official, ex-provost in Glasgow, wants to take powers from the Scottish Parliament. There are... Voting no does not come without risks. If people think that unionists will not punish Scotland, the free education is free, it is going to last. If free prescriptions are going to last, if the council tax freeze will last, if the extra police making our streets safer will last, with a no vote, people are kidding themselves on. And the question again about uncertainty. I asked another Labour politician this in a similar debate. It was Margaret Cullen. I said, Margaret, what will the minimum wage be in five years' time? You want macroeconomic certainty in 30 years from me. What will the minimum wage be in five years' time? The answer is seared into my brain. We have said, Labour, she said, that the minimum wage will change as the economy goes up and down. I said, so if we go into a recession, if we have a de de a deflation, will the minimum wage go down? She couldn't answer the question. They want macroeconomic certainty for us for 30 years. They cannot tell us what an important small policy measure will be in five years' time. In terms of the question with the BBC, of course you'll be able to watch <laughs> the BBC. And on the final issue, which was banking, thrown in at the back of that question, and it's the one George ended with. Let me finish with this. The argument goes that if we maintain sterling, a foreign country will be controlling our economy. <laughs> what errant nonsense. The Bank of England has one target, it's the 2% inflation target. They do not set or work to growth targets, they do not set or work to inflation targets. Uh, to, to, to uh, deficit targets, they do not set or work to debt targets. They have one target to reach, which is an inflation target. We accept 
the discipline imposed by an independent central bank, but we would have all the fiscal levers at our disposal that George Osborne currently has that we in Scotland do not. But just think about it another way. Are they really to say Scotland can't continue to use sterling? The 40 billion receipts from oil and gas currently in sterling would be receipted in a foreign currency. That would double the UK trade deficit and shred sterling overnight. When we're independent, with £47 billion pounds worth of imports from England, we will be the rest of the UK's second largest export market after the United States. Are unionist politicians really going to run around every business in the rest of the UK saying we are going to put additional transaction costs on the best part of £50 billion worth of trade, with all of the job losses that that implies, just to score a political point in the run-up to a referendum. Sterling's our currency too. We contribute to it, we'll continue to co contribute to it. It works for both sides, which is why Alistair Darling actually said a currency union is sensible and desirable. And I'm certain when we get the heat of the referendum out of the way, that's precisely where we'll end up. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've answered all the questions. Thank you very much to Stuart Hosey. Um, I'm going to leave the last word to um, Lord George Robertson. You. Covered a lot of ground there, and I understand that uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy to, to reply uh, uh, to all of these points. Uh, one, can, uh, one, can only, one can only try, and I can understand those apprehensions, and I can understand the questions that are there. You know, the, uh, the lady up there who, uh, who mentioned daily life, at the end of the day, that's what people are actually going to worry about and think about. Um, well, maybe you'll be able to watch the BBC without cost, uh, but though that's not particularly well, good. <laughs> the nationalists want to create a Scottish Broadcasting Corporation. Um, so they see there being a distinction between the BBC, which produces at scale the productions that you talked about, um, but they want a Scottish Broadcasting Corporation, which implies the fact that there are going to be some differences involved in that. But she also mentioned money and banks. And at the end of the day, people are going to worry about that. What we're is doomed. going to be the currency of this country if we were to become a separate state? And it's all very well, Stuart Hosey and other nationalists saying, well, the pound is our pound at the present moment. We've got a right to it. But they're talking about a currency union. <laughs> now, there is a currency union in the world today. It's called the Eurozone. We're doomed. And that's a lot, of, a lot of different economies crash together. And we've seen what happens in the Eurozone. We're doomed. Because we all adopted the Euro. Greece and Ireland and Portugal and Spain are having to accept strictures on them that have been imposed by the European Pardon. Union. <laughs> this is Merkel, who was re-elected last night. A record a vote for her Conservative Party in Germany is one who said, we're not going to bail out these countries who have Pardon. been profligate. <laughs> when we have been conservative and we have been playing safe. So if you want to know how a currency union operates, look Pardon. at the Eurozone. <laughs> and also recognise that a currency union based on the Bank of England, because that's what the SNP are saying, is really the property of the Bank of England after <laughs> your independent Scottish state. So we do not know the answer to these questions, and people who claim that they do know the answers to these questions are simply kidding you on. Yes, you can adopt the pound, like the Panamanians adopt <laughs> the United States dollar, but you've then got no lender of last resort. If your Scottish banks get into We're trouble, doomed. There, is no, there is no Bank of England there to back you up We're and doomed. to save you. So if you want really to know the nuts and bolts about what might happen, just think about if it had been an independent Scottish state and Royal Bank of Scotland and Halifax Bank of Scotland had got into the trouble they got into, there wouldn't have been We're an house to that Chancellor of the Exchequer willing to hand out billions and billions and billions in, or, in order to rescue these banks. So it's hugely important what currency people will have their wages paid in, 
what their pensions are going to be paid in, and whether their banking system is going to be robust, and whether or not the decisions about Scotland's fiscal policy will actually be taken in Edinburgh or more likely be taken We're in Threadneedle Street <laughs> in, the bank, in the Bank of England. Defence. Well, you know, I, you know I, I remember back to my student days when I used to wear a campaign for nuclear disarmament badge as well. NATO is a very important organisation. The SNP ditched 80 years of policy on NATO because they said they wanted to join NATO. Now, why, doesn't, why do they want to join NATO and why do 26 other countries want to join NATO? Well, some of them may be living on the, on the Russian border think they might be invaded, uh, though the invasions that take place tend not to be the normal invasions. Estonia had a cyber attack just uh, two years ago, massive cyber attack there as well. So today's enemies are a bit different from the previous ones, you know. Uh, we're not going to be invaded by France, you know, and we're not going to be invaded by England. But collective security is about more than a physical invasion. It's about dealing with terrorism. It's dealing like the kind of enemy that we're comes doomed. out of the sky <laughs> on the 11th of September 2001 and destroys buildings in New York and in Washington. It's about what happened in Kenya over the weekend, where a bunch of Somali guys come across the border and shoot up a shopping center because Kenya has troops in Somalia trying desperately to deal with the overspill from that failed nation state. So failed nation states, the proliferation of chemical, biological, and radiological weapons, the spread of international terrorism, the way in which, the way in which in organized crime across international boundaries are threats. That's why people believe that NATO as an organization gives them a sense of collective security. But NATO makes it absolutely clear. In its, in its, uh, uh, in its, strategic, uh, its strategic concept, which was agreed only two years ago, the supreme guarantee of the security of the Allies is provided by the strategic nuclear forces of the Alliance, particularly those We're of doomed. the United Kingdom. <laughs> the independent strategic nuclear force of the United Kingdom and France, which have a deterrent role of their own, contribute to the overall deterrence and security of the alliance. And it says, we will maintain an appropriate mix of We're nuclear doomed. and conventional <laughs> forces. Every one of the countries, the 28 countries in NATO, sign up to that. But a party that says unconditionally they will do away with the United Kingdom independent deterrent is hardly We're likely doomed. to sign up to that. <laughs> and yet they say it's unconditional. So our chances of being in NATO when they take that position is very limited. And therefore, although I never would say that we're risking being invaded by another country, there are security dangers in the world every day that we face in the future. And we're NATO doomed. is the collective security <laughs> organization of, uh, of choice. The um, guy over here was saying that you know, we didn't vote for Thatcher and we didn't vote for Major and we didn't vote for Blair, you see. Actually, the people of Scotland voted for the Blair government at each of the elections. And indeed, in the last election that Tony Blair won, which was after the invasion of Iran, actually it was Scottish MPs that made the majority. England didn't get the government it chose because they voted for the Conservative Party but the Scottish votes and Scottish MPs actually gave it to us. And I know it's a, bit of a, it's a wee bit of a, a cheap spot here because Stuart's a bit younger than I am. I was in the House of Commons in 1979. I was there. I was there the night that Jim Callaghan as Prime Minister, way before your time, when Jim Callaghan had a vote of confidence and lost the vote of confidence, and Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. There was an election the, in between. The S... There was an election in between. She had to win an election. Ah. She didn't become Prime Minister one night. The, 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 Labour government, the Labour government lost the vote of confidence, thanks to the SNP vote. A majority of one against the Labour government, with the SNP's 11 MPs voting against the Labour government at that time. And she won the subsequent election, and 18 years of Tory rule, you have uh, passed on that. But it's a, it's a small historical detail uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give to you here. 
uh, at, at, this, at this point. But the fact is, you know, if you're in any electoral system, even in a Scottish electoral system, you won't necessarily get the government you choose. As I say, only 23% of the Scottish potential electorate actually voted for the SNP. In 1997, when I was leader of the Scottish Labour Party, and proud to be leader of the Scottish Labour Party, we got 46% of the vote. That's the biggest percentage that Labour has ever got in Scotland, bigger than any other party, 46% of the vote on a 73% turnout. So, you know, the, the, I think we, we need to sort of look at that in a broader sense than just simply focusing uh, on Scotland as well. Devo Max, you asked the question about more powers for the Scottish Parliament. As I say, a big raft of new powers will come to the Scottish Parliament next year, irrespective of the independence result, with big, big powers to, for, on income tax, on air guns, on stamp duty, and a host of other things as well. But it will be for the 2015 general election for parties to put forward the proposals. And each of the Scottish parties has said, even the Conservative Party has said, that they will put forward proposals to increase the powers of the Scottish Parliament. But that's the time for making that decision, separate to the one, the fundamental one, about whether or not we break up the United Kingdom, of whether we become an independent nation state. Our German friend said, everything's uncertain in politics. And that's very true. The German election yesterday maybe proves that point as well. But you want to try, most people in their daily lives try to minimize uncertainty. You don't know what you're going to get at the end of this year in terms of your studies. You don't know what kind of degree you're going to get at the end of it. And you don't know what kind of job, if any, you're going to be able to get it at the end of your academic career. But you try to minimize Minimise the uncertainties by working hard, by getting good marks, by getting a good degree, by watching the job market in advance. So minimising certain, the uncertainties is part and parcel of our lives. All I'm saying is that in terms of a decision that will affect generations to come, you've got to minimise the uncertainties. And there are an awful lot of uncertainties out there We're which doomed. you've got to bear in mind when that decision uh, is, 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 uh, is actually taken. Stuart made a point that I in invented the electoral system for the Scottish Parliament, and I did it. Actually, it's a bit unfair, the Liberal Democrats, and, and we established it. And yes, we wanted to create an electoral system that would not give a majority to any party unless they got more than 50% of the electorate. I was wrong in that respect, because the Nationalists got the overall majority on the basis of a 45% uh, of the vote. But the motivation was to make sure that no party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Party, or the SNP, would actually get a majority. And we had two coalition governments in Scotland who were the ones that abolished the bridge tolls, who introduced the smoking ban, who, uh, who, who helped the, 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 the NHS, who first of all introduced the council tax freeze, a whole of, uh, and, and the free care for the elderly, all introduced by the Labour Liberal coalition of that time. So I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I hoped that it would kill the desire for separatism stone dead, and I made that point, and it keeps being thrown up by people who used to say free by 93. But I believe that at the end of the day, People in Scotland, I hope, will vote to keep the United Kingdom, to move forward on progressive policies, to stand united with the, with the other people in the United Kingdom in creating a better, fairer society with a lot of clout in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd just like to say thank you very much to both our speakers. Um, a big Aberdeen thank you. Really excellent. And as always, tradition with these debates, we're going to have another vote. Okay, so I'm just going to move us on. And please now vote again. Do you agree with the proposition it is time for Scotland to become an independent nation state or not? If you agree, press 1. If you disagree, press 2. And if you don't know, press 3. Please vote now. Got a few more to come in.
Okay. Let's see what the difference is. Okay, we're going to have the big reveal. Oh, my goodness me. Okay. I have to say, um, just I'll read out the result to you if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, we have now 51% of you, um, there's been a, definitely a swing in favour of independence. 51% of you agree, 38% of you disagree, and 11% of you um, don't actually know um, in relation to this debate. And uh, there's, there's the voting result as well for you. Um, you can maybe see... Um, oh, no, that's the wrong. That, that is not... That is not the, that's the result there. Um, and we'll put, we'll put this up um, on the university website. There's a film of the debate um, that will be going up um, on the module website as well. Um, so you'll be able to um, look at the debate again and go, go through the arguments again. Thank you very much and thanks to our politicians for an excellent debate. It was really excellent.